And finally, 1 Peter 1. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors. All right. The first epistle of Peter. Um, first, let's take a look at verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So who is he writing this letter to is the first question. Um, now the names of these places, they are uh, the names of some Roman provinces uh, that made up a, a region basically to the northeast area of Asia Minor. So, um, first of all, why would Peter address the letter just to these people? And why did he call them strangers? Um, now, this area of Asia Minor, during... Uh, the only really historical reference we can find that would affect this area would be Nero's war with Parthia, the, the war of Armenia, when Nero went to war with Parthia over Armenia. Um, now that would have affected that region quite a bit because there would have been a large Roman military presence in that area. And what that means for Christians is that there would be a lot of persecution. Not that they would go after Christians, but there would be... Uh, Nero was an emperor that demanded to be worshipped as a god, first of all. And there would have been a lot of um, uh, calling for the people to show their allegiance. And the way that they would show their allegiance would be uh, pagan worshipping ways. And, and, and to uh, deify Nero as a god. And this is something that Christians would not do. That is the main reason that Christians were persecuted by Romans, simply because they would not worship the emperor as a god. So, to me, I think that is the um, reason for this letter. And uh, the letter, uh, when you read it, it becomes quite apparent that he is. this is a letter of support towards Christians who are suffering persecution. So probably during that time when um, there was a heavy Roman military presence in that area, there was a lot of persecution going on, and Peter um, felt the need in his heart to write this letter to them. So that's why we have the first epistle of Peter. So strangers, what, 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 who's a stranger to Peter? Um, there, he's, he's writing to Christians, so why is he calling them strangers? Because they're not Jews. They're Gentiles. Um, now, we already went through it with Paul, where Paul explains how when you have faith like Abraham, you become the seed of Abraham, and you are no longer strangers but you are now a part of the family of Israel. Um, so Peter probably understood that, but also Peter was among Jews, and he was among some very conservative Jews who were Christians. And so he might have been just being careful with his words. Um, there was a, a, lo a lot of that going on because of the Romans and, and also because of the Jews. So it's just a matter of weighing the risks against the rewards of what words you, you choose. Uh, Peter was writing this from Babylon. I know there's a tradition that Peter was in Rome, but there's no evidence in any of Paul's letters that Peter was ever with Paul in Rome. Um, and there was times when Paul said, I am here all alone. 
in prison. And nobody is with me. Everybody left me. Not once does he mention Peter. Peter claims, even in, the, in this first epistle, at the end of the epistle, he claims to be in Babylon. And um, P Peter and Paul uh, had an agreement that Paul would go to the Gentiles and Peter would go to the Jews. And there was a large community in Babylon of Jews. So that's likely where Peter was more likely than being in Rome. So he's writing to Gentiles is the, the main point here. He's not writing to Jews. So when he talks about your former traditions, he's not talking about Jewish traditions. Uh, let's take a quick look at it and look at this verse that the rabbi brought up. Uh, starting in verse 13, chapter 1. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts of your ignorance. So, um, I don't think he would call Jews ignorant of God. Um, Typically, when they preach to Jews, it would be like the letter of the Hebrews. They would um, be teaching things from the Tanakh, not talking about ignorance. Okay. But as he which has called you is holy, so be you holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be you holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, so this is referring to uh, how the pagan temples would work, with silver and gold for redeeming, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. He's talking about Greek and Roman gods, the myth, Greek and Roman mythology. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him you believe in God, that raised him from the dead and gave him glory, and that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brothers, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which lives and abides forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached to you. Now Peter, um, he did not speak against the Torah ever. And um, he actually taught a lot from the Tanakh. His his uh, in this letter he talks about the stone of stumbling, and that is uh, um, another teaching from the Tanakh that is about Jesus. And I I made another video about that. Uh, it's called the Rock, the Foundation, and the Stone of Stumbling, Episode Twenty Five, Part Three. So you can look that up if you want to take a look at it. It's a pretty good one. It goes in depth about that topic. Uh, so, you know, that's what Peter's talking about. I don't know what the rabbi's talking about. He's not talking about the Torah. Um, and when, anytime Paul talks about the law as being old or as fading away, he's talking about the Levitical law 
not the the righteousness that is described by the law. Um, the idea of the law is that the parables of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, which Jesus continually taught the Torah in all four Gospels. If you don't know the Torah, you don't know what Jesus is talking about. Okay? So Jesus taught the Torah. So it's his teachings of the Torah that is the new law. And it's completely based upon the teachings in the Torah. So it's not a changing of it. He said, I did not come to change the law. Heaven and earth will pass away before one jot or tittle passes away from the law. And he was talking about the Torah. Because this Torah is still in effect. And it's still the law. But that's the law the world is subject to. That's the law that uh, the flesh is subject to. The, the law of Christ, like I said before, that the, the law of the Torah becomes a floor instead of a ceiling. But it's still a foundation. When you go through the writings of Paul and most of the New Testament authors, they have only negative things to say about the Torah, basically. What does the Tanakh itself say about the Torah and the commandments? Deuteronomy 10. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you but to fear your Lord God, to walk in his ways, love him, serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding today for your good. The Torah is not a curse. It's not against us. The Torah was commanded to us by God because he loves us. It's for our be benefit. Let's go to 1 Kings. And keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies that's written in the Torah, that you may prosper in all that you do. If you keep the Torah, you're going to prosper. It's going to be good for you. Nehemiah chapter 9. Then you did come down on Mount Sinai and did speak with them from heaven. You gave them just ordinances and laws, good statutes and commandments. These things are good. They're just. They're wonderful. The book of Psalms, chapter 1, begins, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the Torah of God. And in his Torah he meditates day and night. Look at Psalm 19, so beautiful, in the middle of the page. The Torah of the Lord is perfect. It's perfect. You don't get better than perfect. It restores the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yea, more than fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. When you read what our Torah says about the mitzvot, they are described as the most beautiful, wonderful thing in the planet. Now, if you remember from, Jer from Deuteronomy chapter 13, the primary concern about the false prophet was that he was going to teach you to follow a God you did not know. Okay, let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 8, this book here. The Israel Bible. Okay, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. For instruction and for testimony, surely they will speak according to this word wherein there is no light. That's kind of a mangling of instruction. That's Torah, okay? Torah, law. And it means the law and the testimony. If they do not speak according to this, there is no light in them. So there's two things. This is the text, the law and the testimony, the Torah and the testimony. Okay, what is the testimony? Well, there's the testimony of the prophets that came um, through God that are in the Tanakh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, 
Nehemiah, Zephaniah, Zechariah, the prophets, and uh, there's the testimony of Jesus and the apostles also. And they do agree. And um, now we can test Jesus and the apostles by looking at the prophets in the Tanakh. And then we can test anyone that comes after that by looking at all of it. So to the law and the testimony. Um, now the Jesus and the apostles do not teach a different God. They teach the same God. They're teaching out of the Tanakh. They're teaching about God. Okay? Now, um, if we take a look, I'm not going to, this is a terrible translation too. It's, it's not that good. Um, instruction, like, it's better if you translate Torah as law, because then we know what you're talking about. But when you say instruction, teaching, they have all these different words that they like to use instead of law. And it, it gets confusing because it's, uh, it takes a lot away from the translation. So, eek. Now, Isaiah chapter 66. So now, um, so what my point is, is that you have to look at, at least look at the entire Tanakh, not just the Torah, but like Isaiah says, to the law and to the testimony. The testimony would be the rest of the Tanakh. This is all the word of God. It's the testimony. Okay? So if we look at Isaiah chapter 66 now, starting in verse 1. Thus says the Lord. So this would be Isaiah. This would be after Moses and the Levites, after David, after Solomon. Uh, this would be Isaiah. Okay? He says, Thus says the Lord. This is like while Solomon's temple was standing. He says this. Thus says the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you may build unto me? And where is the place that may be my resting place? For all these things have my hands made, and so all those things came to be, says the Lord. But on this man I will look, even him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembles at my word. He that kills an ox as if he slew a man. He that sacrifices a lamb as if he broke a dog's neck. And he that offers a meal offering as if he offered swine's blood. He that makes a memorial offering of frankincense as if he blessed an idol. According as they have chosen their own ways. So why is this all their own ways? Isn't this in the Levitical law to do these things? Offer a lamb? Sacrifice a lamb. That, that's all through the Levitical law. Why is he saying that's their own way? That's, he's saying that's not the way of God. And he's also saying, where's my temple? What house can you build to me? He's saying that while Solomon, Solomon, he's saying this while Solomon's temple is sitting right there in Jerusalem. The first temple. So why is he saying that about the temple? And why is he saying that about the Levitical sacrifice, sacrifices? in the temple. He who offers a lamb as if he broke a dog's neck. That would be uh, probably like a, what the pagans were doing. It would be seen as like 
no better, no different. So what is he talking about? He's talking, uh, he's talking about the new world, the new order that he's bringing in. Okay? Now I'm going to, because of the way they, they treat the law in this, this uh, translation, I'm going to use the King James again. It's, it's, a be it's just better because it translates Torah as law. Now we know that Torah means instruction, teaching, but the Torah is the first five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the Torah. That's well understood. And that was in the ark. That was, uh, that's the law. That's known as the law, the Torah. So when the prophets say Torah, you should say law. It should, it makes sense to, it's, it's a better translation to say the law. We know what law is talking about, the law of Moses. Okay, so we'll use the King James because they translate Torah properly. It makes more sense. Okay. Isaiah 42.21 Isaiah 42.21 The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. And now verse 23, who among you will give ear to this? Who will hearken and hear for the time to come? There are some uh, concepts in here that are a little difficult to understand uh, because to a Jew, the righteous servant in Isaiah is Israel. And to a Christian, it's also Israel. But the question is, who is Israel? Is Israel all the body of believers of God, whether they're Jews or Gentiles or whatever they are? Or is Israel the bloodline of Jews only? Or is it some lost bloodline that's been mixed out into the world somewhere and that somehow God has this thing for them? Um, you know, who is Israel? Is Israel Jacob's children, or is it a spiritual family that follows some spiritual concept that Jacob followed and that Abraham followed? Okay, because this is the difference between Jews and Christians. A Christian would say Israel is all believers. Israel, in the Bible, Israel is God's people. So who are God's people? Is it all believers? Or is it according to bloodlines? Because Jesus said, the flesh profits nothing. It's about the spirit. But the Jews would say that the flesh profits everything because it's Abraham's children. And they're actually both are right, I think. I think that there is a uh, still a prophecy. There is still a an affinity towards Abraham's bloodline. But there's also um, the opening up of God's kingdom to the nations, which happened through Jesus, obviously. Okay. So who is Israel? Who is the righteous servant? That is the uh, contentious issue. And see, um, Jacob and Israel are not the same. Like in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. But now thus says the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. Does that mean Jacob is Israel, or is he talking about two concepts here? There's Jacob and there's Israel. And you'll find in the, a lot of the prophecies, they are two different things. Um, 
and it would relate to the northern and southern kingdom. When the prophets lived, the northern kingdom was referred to as Israel, and the southern kingdom was referred to as Jacob. But there's a deeper meaning also. Isaiah chapter 44. Um, starting in verse 19. Behold, I, okay, let's start in verse 11, okay? Verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. So there is only one Savior, and that is the Lord, God. Okay? I have declared and have saved. He declared it by the prophets, and he has done it, because everything Jesus did was prophesied. And I have showed, when there was no strange God among you, therefore you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Because who else could do such a thing? Yeah, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? If we skip down to verse um, 19, same chapter. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people I have formed for myself, that they shall show forth my praise. But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob, and thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. So... These people that he has formed for himself is not O Jacob or O Israel. It's somebody else. Thou has not brought me the small cattle of my burnt offerings, neither has thou honored me with thy sacrifices. Why have they not done this? At this time when he's doing a new thing, because the temple's gone. They can't do that. I have not caused thee to serve with an offering, nor wearied thee with incense. Thou hast brought me no sweet cane with money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices, but thou hast made me to serve thy sins. But thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me, with thy iniquities. Why? Okay, what does that mean? What You haven't brought me any sacrifices and you have wearied me with your iniquities. Because there's no temple, you can't bring a sacrifice. And you won't believe in Jesus, so there's no forgiveness. Like, what? what this is how it is weary in God. Okay? Because he did do a new thing. And he did bring forth something, and they rejected it. Okay. Now he goes on in verse 25. I, even I, am he that blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and will not remember your sins. Remember, remember this is the new covenant in, through, that was talked about by Jeremiah. Put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare, declare you that you may be justified. Your first father sinned, and your teachers have transgressed against me. Therefore I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary, and have given Jacob to the curse, and Israel to reproaches. So, it's not Jacob and Israel that is this new people that he has made. It's somebody else. Because he goes, he says, 
This people I have formed for myself, they shall show forth my praise, but you have not called upon me, O Jacob or Israel. So there's a people that should be calling upon him that are not, and there's another people that are his people that he has made. Okay? So, you know, there's a lot here, but it it's deep stuff. You have to really look at it with a, a in a, a different light. And so all the things the rabbi said about the law and about what Moses and David and the prophets and even Jesus and, and the apostles said about the law, that the law is good. It's God's law. And the law, you know, you should meditate on the law. And, it, and it, that is not the point. The point is, is that when you look at all of God's teachings, if you want to use Torah in a way that means instruction, okay, all of the Torah, all of God's instructions, not just the first five books, but the entire Tanakh, then you have to look at this too. And there's something new going on. And they all talk about it. Zechariah is quite in particular. Hosea, Hosea chapter 1 and 2 is incredible about a new Israel. Not the same Israel that was taken away, a new Israel. So, you know, you want to meditate upon his law, then you should also meditate upon the prophets. That's all I'm saying. And if you don't, and if you say, well, we don't need to listen to that, we'll just stick with Moses, then in a way that is not following God because God has done something new and he wants you to see what he's done.